In the age of AI, how do we achieve breakthroughs in better healthcare experiences? The answers are in the data. The solution is bringing it all together by finding points of connection and insight that span the continuum of care. Quicker, more effective treatments can be personalized for patients and members. Equitable, sustainable, and cost-effective care that begins with better drug development, delivered by resilient healthcare organizations, leading to better care for everyone. The data is out there. You just need a faster, more productive AI and analytics platform to make breakthroughs happen. By bringing together a complex ecosystem of healthcare and life sciences data, SAS Health can help you accelerate insight, turn insight into action, and improve lives. And our solutions connect all your data and create insights you can act on. It's time to deliver better health outcomes for all using the most powerful analytics platform designed for ethical AI. SAS Health Solutions on SAS Via. Let's find the answers. Let's find your next breakthrough. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the session in partnership with uh, GSK, uh, Aviv Healthcare subsidiary. We're going to talk today a little bit around generative AI. I assume you haven't heard anything about that today throughout the event. No? Anyone heard about generative AI? A lot. Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, but specifically, we're going to talk about it in the context of the pharmaceutical uh, sector and the benefit it can drive for all of us, really. Generative AI has a lot of benefits. We will talk about a little bit of that today, particularly in clinical trials, for example, and where that has an application. I'm very privileged to be joined on stage by Neeraj Gohol Mittal, um, Head of Data Analytics and AI um, globally at Vive Healthcare, a subsidiary of GSK. And, and uh, Neeraj, you've got a wealth of experience you bring along with you through your senior leadership positions in the past to give us an insight into where these applications are, where we see the future of generative AI as well. And we're going to have a bit of a conversation, aren't we? We're going to use this as a session to discuss the specifics, a bit of a Q&A for ourselves to, to have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to the audience as well so that everyone else can have a chance to quiz us on some of these areas that we're, we're seeing today. So Nira, should we start off with the first question that we have on the screen? Well, there's, there's our photos, in case you didn't recognize. That's just to confirm that we are who we said we are. So there you go. <laughs> so generative AI, I think the first question, uh, probably the most appropriate for you, yourself, Neeraj, is what, what it is in your context, so, and where do we see this, um, particularly from a medical applications and commercial perspective? Where do we see that there's a benefit now, and where do we see that benefit being in the future? So first of all, thank you for the excellent introduction. Uh, before I start, I just want to give, take a minute to kind of describe what the organization Weave Healthcare does. GSK, I think most of you are familiar with, um, you know, into lots of therapeutic areas. Weave Healthcare is a very important division of GSK, which focuses on one therapeutic area, which is HIV. Now, HIV, as we all know, is sort of, you know, it has lots of issues, including stigma and so many other things. So the organization is very emotionally involved as well, not just commercially, so that you know, we can make sure the whole sort of um, portfolio includes the emotions of the patient, um, uh, patient uh, population as well. So from that perspective, when we build any solutions, we always keep that in mind. So it is true patient-centric organization, commercial success story too. But then from that perspective, any solutions which we build from AI perspective definitely are kept you know, uh, we keep the patient and the commercial both aspects yeah. in mind. Um, so definitely molecule to marketing, we can't deny the importance of Gen AI. But commercial, which is my forte, I can definitely say that from commercial aspect, we have de definitely built solutions which have, which have transformed the organization already. And we are saying this is just the, the beginning of the journey. Yes. So it has done tremendous kind of impacts, and we can discuss more around that. Yeah. yeah. And you said about drug, uh, from a drug discovery perspective, I think there's the recent stats suggested that by 2025, 30% of all drugs that are discovered could be 
discovered by generative AI. Would, That's right. You see that? Are you seeing that already coming through? The Absolutely. So starting from that drug discovery, you're saying 30%. I mean, I do see the potential of much more than that. Wow. Okay. Uh, because in our organization already, we can see a lot of transformations around that, whether it is, you know, observa obs observing the mice uh, yeah. instead of human element there, you know, the, the AI and generative AI sort of, you know, uh, providing those solutions or manufacturing or commercial or marketing or Salesforce. So yeah. all of that is included in that. I mean, that, that's quite impressive, right? And that, that could have an impact on all of us uh, from an efficiency perspective, but also speed to market yeah. of these drugs. Uh, another area that, I mean, we've, we've been discussing with other organizations is around the concept of personalized medicine. So fine-tuning medicine specifically for the patients. Yes. Again, is that an area that you've, you've seen much of or you're, you're seeing that as a, a, a vision? Absolutely. I mean, personalization, that? even before Gen AI, is something I'm passionate about because whether you're talking solutions within the organization or outside, personalization is everywhere, right? Whether it is your coffee or, you know, anything day-to-day -day life, so why not medicine? So from that perspective, anything around the patient population, bringing the diversity of, uh, you know, patient population into it, all of that is included, um, and we definitely want to make the impact through that. Yeah, and that could have a, an impact, again, from a tailoring of the specifics of these drugs to individuals to make it much more appropriate. Yeah. And we're seeing it across other sectors. We talk about personalization and the use of Gen AI, whether it's in retail for clothing, for financial services, for bank products. I think this is obviously going to have a much uh, more altruistic impact. Yeah. But again, there, there's similarities there, I imagine, within other sectors from what we're seeing around the applications of this, making it a world for good, let's say, in the use of AI? I can give an example, actually. So from the personalization perspective, one from within the organization, uh, what we do is we have, for example, Next Best Action Solution, which uses AI and, you know, which uses a couple of other AI solutions as part of that. So what the solution does is it pre sort of, you know, um, provides the messages to the sales force, to the sales reps in advance before they see the the HCPs or the MSLs, medical science liaisons. Now, with this, with this, they all before the call or after the call, they get personalized suggestions around that, which which is generative AI, kind of you know, churning all of that and providing very simplistic emails to them without them knowing there are there is any complexity behind the scenes. So, excellent. I think again, very impactful and something that uh, all of us will maybe get the benefits on from the use of, of Gen AI. Gen AI. If we move on, and I think you, you're going to kind of pose this one, uh, Niraj, around the use in the clinical trials uh, perspective. Yeah, so from clinical trials, definitely generative AI is doing a lot, actually. Yeah. Uh, and particularly for us, where we want the diverse population and particularly the back, black population to be part of our yes. HIV uh, patient community. But then I would throw it back to you, Ian, because this is your forte. Yeah, I, and particularly an area. There's a few areas we're seeing rise up from a generative AI application perspective around the concepts of synthetic data, which you may have heard of, and also digital twinning. And I'll go through those in a little bit of detail, but synthetic data, the ability to generate new observations that kind of mask and protect the privacy and the individual consumer or the patient in this case, and creating new data that then can be trained on can massively uh, increase then that clinical trial, the speed to clinical trial process by one, introducing more data observations, but two, then adding that privacy element into it. I think that's going to be crucial in this space is the use of synthetic data for that. Again, another stat I've heard, 60% of all AI applications will be built on synthetic data by the end of 2024, only a year or so away. We're going to see synthetic data being the, the kind of the, uh, the, the core or the ground for AI applications as well. And on digital, digital twinning, this concept of creating um, a replication of us as patients or as consumers, and then uh, stress testing or scenario testing or using what-if analysis to understand the impact of some of these things. Yeah. So again, particularly within clinical trials, if we can start to understand the impact of these drugs before they've started to go through that process, we can make that hopefully more efficient, I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. And clinical trials is the place where we start, particularly for pharma industry. Everything starts from there. Uh, and all these ethics and biases which we yep. have been hearing today is very, very applicable, particularly in clinical I think that's, trials. That's, that has a foundation approach to a lot yeah. of this. I think the efficacy and making sure that this is ethically de determined, but also the, the concept of bias, right? We all talk about bias. Bias comes in an all the way through an AI process, whether it's in the data, the, the development of the model, or the decision. 
again, if you can start to simulate this, you can start to understand where there are risks and hopefully mitigate for those, potentially also creating synthetic data to uh, enrich the populations that are maybe underrepresented yeah. in, the, in the trials that, that they go through. So. That is so true, actually. And particularly, we have seen that we have a lot of um, you know, different communities as part of our patient outcomes. So we really need to include all of them to make the right impact, right outcomes. Um, and as I say, you know, that includes all the departments, um, of course, starting from clinical trials. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm lucky enough to, to, to work for an organization that works cross-sector. So we, we see a lot of this in financial services. We see a lot of this in public sector. I think some of these methodologies, yes. particularly around uh, the synthetic data aspect, have applications across places. I know we've probably got representation from a lot of industries in the room today. But again, think about this. Think about how you can start to uh, stress, scenario test any application right? yeah. with, with generative AI. It becomes that foundation or the data that can empower a lot of these types of approaches and decisions. And synthetic data, I mean, as you rightly say, with, with all the regulations yes. we work with, it really, really is helpful because we don't need to wait for the real data to kick in and yep. we can sort of, you know, um, use synthetic data, stress test it and implement it as well. Um, well it's it's, it's it. great to protect the identity and the, and the patient information, Absolutely. but you're right, actually getting hold of data is, is a lot of the challenge. And I imagine others in the room would attest to that. Getting a hold of the right data at the right time is usually the biggest challenge for data analysts, data scientists. So kind of enhancing that, uh, putting that process uh, much higher up the food chain is going to be important as well. Definitely. So with the next question we've got around how you can deliver effective uh, generative AI, it's not just about creating it, but how can you embed this within an ecosystem, particularly in ecosystems that are much more complex than ever before. Uh, I'm sure a lot of those in the room will have experienced this, both where the data's coming from, where the model's coming from, whether that's proprietary, in-house, or open-sourced, as well as the decision maker. So how can we get value out of this? Anyway, yeah. How can we make sure that this works together? So for me, integrated word is quite important, actually, because that's where what we are doing is whatever solutions we had. And so we have been working on AI solutions a lot already, and we had the SaaS partnership as well. We have worked with SaaS a lot, actually, in yep. those applications. So AI is nothing new for us. We have been working on AI a lot. But then what happened, as I mentioned, that not only we have been integrating the AI applications, but integration of Gen AI on top of it, so that this all seems like an integrated scenario. Gen AI is not something which sits in isolation and provides you the content or provides you the suggestion. It has to have the right base. And then, obviously, when we look into the whole portfolio from data ingestion to data quality to data transformation and then data to action, that's where the generative AI is playing a huge role. It is very, very important. And then, obviously, in pharma, cloud was a, a word which we, we were not even using a few years back. But then now, we are experimenting more and more so that we, we can sort of, you know, diversify with all those security measures, uh, of course, in place. It's certainly, I, I, again, the, the speed of evolution of this. We've seen generative AI, I mean, a, a term that a year ago we weren't really talking about now being the most important word that we seem to have at the event today. Uh, and the scale of this, so scaling to these challenges. I imagine yes. you see that, right? How do we scale to these new challenges that arise and also making sure the data is available? Absolutely. So being in global role, that is one word which becomes very, very critical, scaling. In a country, fine, you're working with one country, you don't have uh, that much of pressure around scaling. So you can nail it, but then fine with scaling. With global solutions, I already have to think about if we have nailed something, we have piloted something, how do we scale it to the, to the different countries, different regions? And then don't forget the cultural nuances and differences and data privacy and, you know, all of those rules on top of it uh, from one country to the other. Uh, when, when I talk about international markets versus European markets versus Latin America or the U.S., very, very different and diversified portfolios. So from that perspective, cloud definitely plays a huge role. And, of course, we can make it persona-based, securities and all of that, different layers of security on top of it to make sure we cater to all the organization and all the audiences. And that's, that's an important point around the security of this and, yeah. and accessing all of that information in, in the right place at the right time, particularly around data silos. I imagine you, you must see that where the silos of information are being captured. They're not necessarily being brought together. 
Have you, have you, if, have you tackled that? That is so true, actually, and that, that, that's not unique to us. And although I think we have gone way ahead in this journey, uh, but then the way we started, everything was kind of, you know, so the activity data was, was siloed, the sales data was siloed, patient data was something completely different, and medical, of course, you know, because, you know, of the regulatory and compliance issues, we could not even touch. Now we are experimenting more and more, bringing things together, because, for example, if you talk about customer, customer is the customer. Customer is approached by medical teams. Yes. They're approached by commercial teams. We cannot work with siloed data because whether we are calling engagement yep. score or anything, it will give you half the insights. So integration, it's, it's really, really critical and crucial. The more silos we can remove, uh, better data quality yeah. we can have. I think that's, it's a better decision and a better outcome. Absolutely. So certainly from what we've seen around the interoperability and the scalability side, the benefits of cloud, bringing these things out of the silos, out of R&D, and out of the lab, as it were, into production, yeah. that is a challenge across all organizations, right? That's true. And, and we all see that, that bringing this together in, a, in a, a platform that enables that interoperability is important. And the rise of uh, the capabilities within, again, th there's a lot of things that uh, analysts, data scientists now want to have access to. Some of those come much faster through the open source community. So it's, it's putting that governance structure around it. And, we probably don't want to spend too much time on regulations, but we see that particularly financial services is around regulating the governance of that, that company-wide to make sure that the right models are being used at the right time for the right decision. That is a challenge, That right? is a challenge, right. yes, yeah. No, I, I agree, and again, that's something we all need to work on, and we are aware of that. But then I would also say that in the name of challenges, we should not stop ourselves doing things. We just need to kind of, you know, take small steps and, of course, you know, be compliant. Of course, you know, we don't want to run over that line. Yep. But then we need to sort of keep working and then leverage generative AI, which, as we all know, um, it's, it's a tool which can help us kind of, you know, um, do things much more faster, as one of the conversations was saying, steam engine it is, yes. so I agree. And again, the, the, the concept of continuous improvement, it must be something familiar to you as well, is, is iterating this as fast as you can around that life cycle. Being agile is, is the key, and I would suggest that, that to everybody. I know that we say agile, being agile is a thing just for the sake of it, yeah. but then I have truly seen the value of being agile because then you can fail fast, you can go back and do things, you know, almost retreat um, again. Um, one little example again, you know, when we created this um, NBA tool, our next best action tool, we included the sales prediction with that, you know, so additional two data points. And then we thought, why can't we include the channel preference, which was a siloed uh, solution, also as part of um, our solution, which has worked fantastically well. Because now the infield teams goes and talks to the healthcare professional. They know this person is virtually driven or face-to-face -face driven. There are different people who have different preferences. So we are sort of doing all of that, but then that was all possible because of the agile approach. Yes. You can try it, test it, do it more. If you fail, go back. And I, I don't think we could go through this conversation without talking a bit more about the bias and the ethical implications. And, and what you need to consider, particularly around the pharmaceutical application size. Yeah, so with bias, and again, see, we all know that biases will be there. Uh, so it is already there. It's almost like our human brains, which have been developed the way our childhood have been or our ancestors have been. You cannot change that. How we change that is something, you know, we need to be sort of in, in the rooms, in the organizations, sitting that, you know, it has to follow the ethics um, um, and, and, you know, the biases can be removed. I feel that biases could be on steroids with generative AI uh, because human beings, you know, if they have anything around, you know, um, uh, racism or sexism or anything, it, you can multiply it, I don't know, with whatever factor yes. with generative AI and that will see through. So we really need to be careful around the biases. And then you've been hearing stories around Amazon recruitment tool, uh, which kind of was only preferring uh, men over women because of the historical uh, men preference. Or, in fact, on this side of the table, even being the data scientist, you see that data scientists have come up with Series and Alexas, which are female voices and female names, which also needs to be looked into. So it's not just the other side of the industry. Being the data scientist yourselves, you need to be careful around those things. Of course, and it obviously affects all of us, but the materiality of some of these decisions, and that is right. crucial right, to get this right. And I think we've talked about uh, some of the pillars of this, 
as, as, as we've spoken, Niraj, but I think diversity of data, right? Having that diverse data, making sure it's the right data and fit for purpose, yeah. for the applications that you're developing is going to be core. And also transparency, right? Transparency within the process, understanding how that data is being used, whether it's synthetic or real, but being able to be clear to patients, clear to those that need to know where that information is coming from, what led to that decision is even more imperative now that we're thinking about a more regenerative type approach, right? We need to be drawing those lines between the dots much clearer than we ever have before. I really like the transparency factor, and I'm sure you work with across the industry, and you will see that. Within pharmaceuticals, what we are trying to do is that we are creating, we are making the data plumbing transparent from end to end as much as possible so that nothing is a black box that, you know, you just see the outside shiny sort of, you know, um, recommendations or, or, or whether it is automatic content generation or anything, you see the whole transparent plumbing. Um, I think that is a very, very good point. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, so with data diversity, transparency yeah. is quite. Cool. Also, I, the concept of having a regular audit, I think you've kind of touched upon this now, but making sure that, again, what is going into the system is the right thing, making sure that uh, the models themselves are fit for purpose. I think we're going now through much faster cycles. And again, a few of you will have talked or heard talks about large language models and fine tuning those models. But if you fine tune it on the data today, that's not the data tomorrow. And again, there may be more synthetic data that's part of that process. There needs to be a much faster feedback loop, I would suggest. Yeah. On this one, I mean, I just want to tell you that uh, when, when I was talking to Ian that day, I tried to sort of find a very simple definition of artificial and yes. generative AI from, from chat GPT itself. And it gave a very nice example, actually, that it's, it's a Lego building exercise, which a child sort of learns from his parent, from his or her parent. So similarly, Gen AI is just a Lego building which it has seen in the past. So it is basically using that to yes. sort of create further Lego models. So exactly to that point, we really need to be sort of, you know, cautious of that and, yes. and keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think that's a, good, that's a good analogy to kind of give that final point on the generative AI piece. It is building blocks. Yeah. But you've got to make sure those building blocks are robust. And you wouldn't build a house on sand. You'd <laughs> want to build it on solid foundations. And I think the foundations, and we, we talk about these as foundational models, they, they are going to be revolutionary, but the foundation needs to be strong. You need to have that data piece sorted in the first instance. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got to the, the, the 20 minute mark. What we thought we'd also do is allow for questions around the audience. Obviously, I'm sure you have a lot of things you may want to ask around this topic. I think we should have a roving mic somewhere. Yes. We'll, should we bring a mic around? So before we summarize, I thought maybe we'll ask, see if there's a few questions. Thanks for the talk. Uh, am I audible? OK. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so hello. Uh, my, my question is more like a curious question. Uh, so that's for both of you. Uh, in your experience, have you seen, uh, so we mentioned digital twin in our talk today. So have you seen and uh, came across any example of successful implementation of a digital twin? Uh, and what, is, what was the use case? For both of you. you I, I couldn't quite, sorry, I couldn't quite catch that. So we, we mentioned digital twin today in our talk. Yeah. So I'm curious to know if you, both of you have come across any working example, a successful example of digital twin in your respective organization. So is that working examples of generative AI being used today? Is digital it? twin. Digital twin. Digital okay. twin, yes. Yeah. So you want I'm, to, yeah, I can yeah, tell it. Yeah, so yeah. digital twinning as a concept has been around for some time, and we've seen it work really well in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, sorry, we're talking about manufacturing of, of, of drugs or of other things. So manufacturing is a good example, and we've seen that, and we've worked on projects where we've deployed these capabilities to, to uh, kind of synthesize, but also um, showcase how a system may operate. Again, once you're doing that, you can feed in synthetic data to test it, to stress it, but you're taking a physical environment and then replicating that digitally to understand from a QA perspective and from an uh, optimization perspective whether it's working. So yes, we've worked on a, quite a number of those projects already, both um, on the public sector side and the private sector side, where manufacturing is core to the delivery of some of the outcomes that they're looking to provide. I don't know if you've seen that specifically on... I, I can give um, one very quick example, maybe not, not related to that, but a yeah. simple digital twin which my team sort of came up with 
was the coaching which we do to the um, you know different teams so instead of a person doing that how generative ai can be useful and literally because nowadays we can have the images and the same coach you know could be speaking in different languages uh, that's a very successful digital twin actually so it's a very quick um, use case we came up with and we'll have many more like that so yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's, it's to think it in concept of all of these interacting together as well. I wouldn't say digital twinning works in a silo. It needs to be empowered by the data. It needs to be empowered by the decisioning system that you're going to be applying. But again, it's a good way in which you can start to test these things in a safe environment before yeah. you take them out into the real world. So it's a good question. There's another I think, question over here. Hello. Yeah, so I had a question around the drug discovery process. So when it comes to using artificial intelligence, is there a difference between um, finding chemical molecules versus biopharmaceutical products? So I'm sure, I mean, if you want to add, please add. For me, I mean, it, it doesn't differentiate at the AI level, I would say, because it's a different technology, because, you know, we're talking, if it is biopharmaceuticals, you're talking biosimilars, you're talking chemicals, and you're talking genetics. All of this, I would not say, is limited to biogenerative AI. Uh, yes, it can enhance both the processes equally. It wouldn't, I wouldn't say that one uh, would be sort of impacted more than the other. Um, good question, but then I know that because our organization is into both. Uh, uh, when I'm talking our, our organization, by the GSK, so it works across both the areas. Great. I don't think I could answer that any better. I think uh, the fact is, again, getting that information and making sure you're testing all of those iterations exactly. and yeah. relationships, th th there is benefit on both sides for yeah. this. But again, it's getting that right feed into it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, thank you for for the, the discussion. And I have, I would like you to link two of the things that you've mentioned. One, generative AI to uh, the, the part of um, how do you do synthetic data and, and that problems about when you have very imbalanced, very biased data yes. and twisting it a little bit more on pharmaceutical, like for example with genetics and proteomics and metabolomics, like you have a problem that you may be missing a genetic map or a proteomics map of a particular set of the population. How do you balance that and where do you think, give me three key points that you would say, okay, this is how I would tackle lacking of data to generate synthetic data to then use generative AI. Can I just add something? And of course, synthetic data will be Ian's forte. And of course, you know, um, uh, I'm sure Ian can talk about it 48 hours. Um, what I just wanted to add before you start with that is that I know this is big data conference. We need to also keep in mind when, whenever we talk, uh, any sort of data, synthetic or non-synthetic, it's not just the big data, it's the small data as well which matters. For example, you know, uh, things like um, this particular woman doesn't adhere to diabetes medicine or something of that sort. It's a very simple conclusion which you can make just based on few sort of you know, imaging or biomarkers and all of that. What we don't know is the small data. What is the financial implication she may have? What is the socioeconomic background? Does she have other responsibilities and all of that? So that part I just wanted to add. Um, so yeah. No, I, and that's a good uh, qualifier. I mean, it, it's making sure the data is representative, right? And, and you, it's very hard to get fully representative data for any challenge, for us as humans, let alone as machines. But it's understanding where there may be gaps, I would suggest, initially, is that where there may be gaps in the data, where you might have under-representation, or you just don't have access to that data at the time. That's where synthetic data can have a part to play. I think the concern is, as with any generative AI, and particularly with large language models, is they're constantly creating new information, and if that's incorrect, and then it's being fed into the training of new models, you could exacerbate that bias even further. So it's understanding what's going in, what's being created, but more importantly, where is that feedback, or where is it going to be used? I mentioned the stat about 50-60% of data that goes into AI may all be generatively, uh, well, synthetically generated. That is a fear as well, that if we're not doing this in a controlled way, yeah. that you could start to exacerbate some of those biases by purely just iterating over and over, and actually we end up with no 
real data being used anymore. And some of the concerns around the, those that provide large language models is exactly that, that the answers they may start giving will get worse over time. I think you may have seen in the news, even ChatGPT has, has evolved to have got worse because of the feedback back look from us as humans going in and saying, now that's not the right answer, when actually it is the right answer, but it's then training itself again. So there is it's a double-edged sword on that, that to make sure that you are putting the, the efficacy at the, at the main point as the data that's going into the system. But it's a good question. Okay, I think we've got a few more. There's one at the front. Have you got time for one Last. more? Okay. okay. We will be on the stand 740 if you want to come to after the session if we don't get a chance to ask questions now. There's bubbly, I've been told, as well. So there's some nice drinks if you want to join us there. Yes. Uh, very nice. Very yep. Good. Could I ask, currently, do you think that, I mean, at what level would you say is the pharmaceutical industry in terms of data anal analytics and proper going towards a much more data-driven industry right now? And where would you like it to be currently? So the question is whether it is data-driven already, pharmaceuticals. It is what I mean. Uh, my main question is uh, it might be data-driven already, but you hold I'm sure that... Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. okay. The thing is it, it might be data-driven already, but I'm saying that if you look into the future, let's say, for example, from your experience, where do you think it, sh it could go and where basically where we are currently... If you know, if you understand what I'm saying, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I can definitely say today and the next, but what will happen in, in maybe even five years' time is difficult to predict, actually. The way we are... Uh, so one, one classic example we were discussing, we used to make the annual strategies and annual plans within the data analytics teams. Now I think it will come to qu the quarterly, if not monthly, and then we'll have to see because within a quarter we would have come up with so many pilots and all of that. So what I'm trying to say is with the kind of speed we have, whatever progress we have seen so far, I, I'm sure within next two years it will be 20 times more, which I'm observing already. Um, and again, uh, we can discuss a lot on that. If we yeah. Yeah. I think we'd all wish we had a, uh, a crystal ball to see into the future. I think it's hard to say. But again, it's in our remit as custodians of data and those in the sector to, to drive this in the right direction. I think it's on us all in this room today to decide the future of this, yeah. I would say. So that's maybe a message to leave on. For the, for the end of the session. So thank you, Neeraj. It's been a pleasure thank speaking you. to you today. Hopefully you've learned something. I think we've had as many questions as we've answered. More questions have been asked. Uh, but uh, please join us uh, in Booth 740 if you want to explore any of this further. But thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.